this morning. No shortcuts is the title of the message. No shortcuts. Anybody here like a good shortcut? Come on, you know it. There's something satisfying, isn't there, to finding a good shortcut, particularly when you're driving. Now, I would say this is especially true for the men in the room. Men love a good, show, uh, a good shortcut. I mean, whenever we're driving somewhere, we are thinking about how can I find a way that's, that's a shorter way around to where I need to get to go because we don't want to sit in traffic. We hate red lights, right? We hate red lights, particularly those left turn arrow red lights. Those are the pits, aren't they? And they take forever in this town. There's lots of them. And so we try and find our shortcuts because we don't want to sit in traffic forever. Now, here's the thing. The women in the room probably also know that us men, our shortcuts only work about half the time. And some of you are like, half? <laughs> that's, 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 you know, pretty bold right there, Ryan. I don't know if half is quite what my guy gets. But, you know, let's say they work half the time. And, you know, the other half of the time, there's, there's uh, you know, it turns out to be the wrong way. Or we get lost. Or, you know, there's more traffic that way than we thought or whatever. And it doesn't work out quite that well. There's a famous quote that is uh, attributed to a world-famous opera singer, Beverly Sills, and it goes like this. There are no shortcuts to anywhere worth going. There are no shortcuts to anywhere worth going. The point, of course, of this quote is this, that there is, that the best things in life have to be genuinely worked for. They have to be earned, right? They require patience. They require time. They require the development of character. But we... Americans love our shortcuts. We of the microwave, high-speed internet, fast food drive through generation, we love shortcuts. We hate patience. How many know we hate patience? Let's be honest. We hate to wait. We don't want to wait for anything. We don't, and we don't want to work hard. We want a handout, right? We don't want to save up for the new car, right? We want the new car today, and we don't care if we've got to pay astronomical interest rates to get it. We want it now, and we'll pay for it. We're willing to go into debt to have it now because we hate to wait. But how many know the have-it-now lifestyle has some consequences, right? The have-it-now lifestyle has some consequences, and we don't necessarily want to face those. Now, for, the, two, for the, the first two plus months of 2014, we have been studying the life of Abraham and going through a lot of just practical lessons from this great man of faith, both from successes, from his mistakes. For the last six weeks, we've been focused in uh, on the life of Jesus as we've kind of been leading up to and through Easter. And now that we've, we've got Easter in the rearview mirror, we're going to, again, shift our focus back to Abraham for a few weeks because there's just more to be learned from his life. And so this morning we're going to do just that. And we've come to this point in Abraham's life where this word shortcut comes in to play. But since it's been maybe about a month and a half since, since we've talked about him, we're going to just take three minutes to kind of bring you up to speed. Here's where we've come from. Some of you are new since then and you haven't heard any of this. And so I'm going to give you like a quick synopsis. Where has Abraham come from? Genesis 11 through 12, 11 and 12, the Bible says that Abraham is called by God. Actually, at that time, his name is Abram, and you're going to hear me refer to him as Abram because his name has not yet been changed, but those are kind of interchangeable terms, Abraham and Abram. Uh, in Genesis 11 and 12, he's called by God at the age of 75 to leave his homeland. He spends the, the vast majority of his first 75 years in the, a land called Ur, which is now modern-day Iraq, God calls him and Abram obeys. He packs up his family, his nephew, Lot, and he heads for what is now present-day Israel. And all through Genesis chapters 12 through 15, we read about just the struggles and the challenges of that process. And he has a lot of experiences. He experiences famine. He temporarily heads down to Egypt. Uh, he ends up parting company with his nephew Lot because of a land dispute. He ends up going out into battle against this army of four kings that's like four times the size of his fighting force, and he wins by God's hand. And this is all the events that take place, all spread out over a period of about 10 years. Basically, he and his wife are nomads. They, they're living in tents. They're, they're rarely in the same place, more than just a short period of time. And, and yet through those 10 years, Abram is given repeatedly 
given promises. Promises by God that, that he's going to inherit a land. Promises by God that he's going to be uh, favored and he's going to be blessed. And through that process, he becomes very wealthy. Through that process, God says, I will be your shield and your protection. And, and he is. And then best of all, God promises to make him into a nation. In fact, he tells Abram that his offspring are going to be as numerous as the sand on the seashore, as many as the stars in the sky. And it's this wonderful promise. However, as we see throughout those chapters, there's, there's hints at it that Abram has a very significant problem. And it's that problem that we're confronted with in Genesis 16 this morning. If you have your Bibles, go to Genesis 16. We're going to read starting in verse 1. It says there, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave, perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. Later on in verse 16, we're told that Abram is 86 years old when this takes place. So Abram and Sarai have this legitimate problem. And it's because of the problem that they're faced with that they end up making a crucial mistake. As I said, it's been 10 years now since Abram first received that instruction from the Lord to leave his homeland. 10 years that he's been living in Canaan. 10 years since he was first told, I will make you into a great nation. He's had this promise that he's been hanging on to, and yet... Ten years into that promise, Abram and Sarai can't help but feel like they are nowhere nearer the fulfillment of that promise than when they started ten years ago. It would seem like they haven't made any progress. In fact, it would seem quite the opposite because they have no no children, they have no son, and now Sarai's womb is ten years older. Right Now here's what you have to understand. Sarai was 65 years old when she first received the promise from God that she would be made, she would be the mother of a nation. 65 years old. Now we've got some 65 to 70 year old women in this room. Any of you thinking about starting a new family anytime soon here? 65 to 70 year olds. No. Mom, you're in that category. 65 years old? I mean, I can see it now. Hi, I'm Ryan. This is my brother, Chris. He leads worship. This is my brother, Kevin, wherever Kevin plays bass guitar. And this is my little brother, you know, Andy or whatever. I mean, I can just see it for me here. No! In fact, I did a little research online this week, and uh, I found out that currently the oldest living mother is a woman from India. We have her picture. I don't know how well you'll be able to see it. Her name is Rajo Devi Lohan from India, and she gave birth to her first child, a daughter named Naveen, at the age of 69. Pregnancy was a product of in vitro uh, fertilization treatment. That was five years ago, so she is now the 75-year-old mother of a five-year-old, okay? But I think we can, based upon the wows I'm hearing, we understand this is a very minuscule exception to a much broader rule, right? There are not too many 65-year-old plus women having kids. And that's how old Sarai was when she got the promise. Now it's 10 years later. How many can see they're looking and saying, we are not getting anywhere closer to the finish line here. We're getting closer to one finish line, but not the one we're, not the promise, okay? My womb's not getting any younger. Ten years later, still no baby bump. And so as we've read, they take things into their own hands. They grow impatient with God, and in an effort to jumpstart the vision, they make this terrible 
choice, this terrible decision. And Sarai suggests to Abram that, they, that, that, as we've just read, that he take her servant Hagar to bed in the hopes of conceiving. Now, archaeologists and historians have actually pieced together that this was a somewhat of a, a, a common practice in this historical period. And it was done with the understanding that once the child was born, that Sarai would formally adopt that child as her own, and she would become, be considered the legitimate mother of that child. So Hagar would, would then lose any mother interest in the child. And so there was a cultural, uh, you know, sort of precedent for this. And on the, on the surface, it even kind of looks like a good idea. It seems like a very practical or logical solution to a problem that has no other, you know, identifiable answers. You've got to understand, uh, the gal from India we just had on the screen, that was, that was the product of medical technology that obviously was not available 4,000 years ago in Abram's day, right? This is not something that he had an option. And so if you couldn't do it naturally, it didn't happen back then. And so they, they take things into their own hands. And Abram and Hagar, they, you know, get together and conceive. And in doing so, what they do is they compromise God's best plan. And they settle instead for something other than what God intended. And we're going to see in a little bit, it backfires on them. Probably, it's likely that all of us have done this in some, some format. Probably plenty of times. Not, not what Abraham and Sarai did. <laughs> we probably haven't done that, okay? <laughs> Put that out of your mind. But we've compromised God's best plan, right? We've compromised God's best plan for an inferior one because we've decided upon the quick and easy way. We've taken the shortcut. We've decided to be impatient because let's, let's, let's face it, it's tough waiting on God, right? It's tough waiting on God's timing, especially when we look around us and we see the world is constantly spinning. It's constantly going. We see that people around us that don't seem to be waiting for God and they seem to be making headway in life. And, and it seems like they're getting places faster and, and maybe we begin to feel left behind. But how many know patience has rewards, right? Patience has rewards. Usually there is a payoff for patience. I think about TV dinners. I mean, honestly, I can't imagine anything that's quite as personally, if you like them, good for you. Personally, I can't imagine anything quite as disgusting as a TV dinner. I mean, it's hard to imagine anything much nastier, but oh, don't they make it look so good on the packaging, right? I mean, they make those mashed potatoes just look so creamy and oh, that to meat, it's going to be a tender and a juicy, you know? I mean, it's just like, wow, I got to have this. And the vegetables, they just look just so like, you know, just, I don't know, better than vegetables ought to look. And so we buy this thing, and we're given this promise in just a couple of short minutes, you can have this delectable and tasty dinner, or, okay, or you can slave over the stovetop, the oven, the grill for about an hour and get the same result. But how many know it's not the same result, right? Because how it looks on the package ain't how it comes out of the microwave. I'm sorry. Because when you take one bite into that, gen, that, that tender, supposedly tender piece of chicken, you're, you, honestly, you're like, how did they dre manage to dress up cardboard and make it look like chicken? Like, it's not anything. But you might as well honestly take the plastic food out of your little kid's toy kitchen and, and cut that up and eat it because it's going to taste about that good and probably be about as nutritious for you, right? Like, it's, that's, that's how it is. But, oh, a home-cooked meal. There's something about a home-cooked meal that can actually, wow, I mean, it, it can inspire. And we get fired up. And yes, it's work. And yes, it's time. But the payoff, there are some things in life worth waiting for. Now, it's a silly illustration that's got no eternal value, but I think it makes the point. Psalm 37.7, on the other hand, addresses this very idea through a, a, a very spiritual perspective. Psalm 37.7 says, Be still in the presence of the Lord, and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. I mean, that pretty much says it right there. It's harder to wait on the Lord when we look around and we see 
what would apparently look like those prospering through wicked practices, through taking life's shortcuts. But let me tell you, it's an illusion. It's an illusion. It might look good, but it's an illusion. Because, you know, just before this, in verses 1 through 4 of the same psalm, Psalm 37, the Lord declares, Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong, for like grass they soon fade away. Like spring flowers they soon wither. Can I tell you, every Minnesotan understands this concept right here. Okay? We know it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of time. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but winter is coming. It's around the horizon. I don't care how good your garden looks in a few weeks after we saturate all this rain and you'll have beautiful flowers. It's not going to last, right? They're going to wither. They're going to die because winter is coming. Sorry, that's kind of a downer, I know. But that's life. He goes on. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. God says, essentially, don't let appearances fool you. You can't shortcut God's best plan. And when you try to, it's like settling for that microwave dinner. It, it, and, and the thing is, is it actually, it carries with it consequences. God says, eventually, the lives of those who live that way, they're going to wither away. Sooner or later, the impatience that they live in is going to lead to trouble. God says later on in that very same psalm, Psalm 37, now verse 34, he says, wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. Now, here's the thing, church. There's so many ways from our modern culture that we could apply this, but just one example, the workplace. You know, you're in the workplace, and there's that person, so, you know, just so-and-so over here. Everyone knows that, that they're cheating the system to, give it, to get ahead. Everyone knows that they fudge the numbers or that they clock out early or that they fleece the boss somehow. And it seems like they're getting ahead. It seems like they're getting the promotion. And maybe it's even tempting for us to do that because we want that promotion and we want that pay raise. And, and so what we've got to remember is they'll get their day. Yes, they may be advanced right now, but they will get their day. You watch. They always do. And if you'll continue to work with integrity and with righteousness, and if you'll maintain a strong work ethic, even when others around you are sloughing off, God will, as he says in his word, exalt you to inherit the land, that you will get the promotion, that you will experience the blessing, and you won't have to have dirtied your soul to have done it. Going back to Genesis 16, remember I told you that it backfires on Abram and Sarai? Check this out. Verses 4 through 6. When she knew, she being Hagar, when, when, she, when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. You do with her whatever you, you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Check this out. Hagar gets pregnant, and I mean, almost immediately, a soap opera breaks out. I mean, seriously, days of our lives could like just draw up an episode from what you see right here. Because what happens, Hagar gets attitude, Right? She starts to despise Sarai, probably because she feels used and sexually exploited. Okay? Then there's this tension, there's this drama. Then Sarai gets angry at Abram. She says, You did this. She doesn't mention the fact that it was her idea, right? It was her idea for him to do it. She says, You did this. You got her pregnant. She conveniently omits that, you know, it was her, her part. And then Sarai starts mistreating Hagar. To the point that Hagar runs away. Can you see how quickly sin can escalate out of control? I mean, do we see that? How quickly it just goes from one thing and then boom, just that, that is how the devil loves to work, church. He is so tricky that way. Before Abram even knows what he's dealing with, he's, he's being slammed with jealousy, pride, finger pointing, name calling, depression, backbiting, and a runaway. Yikes! I mean, that's a bad day. It's a rough, that's a rough stretch. But there's something we've got to remember here. When we try and take matters into our own hands, 
instead of trusting God, then we have also got to be prepared to deal with unpleasant results. When we take, I'm going to say that again, take matters into our own hands instead of trusting God, we've got to be prepared to deal with some unpleasant results. See, Psalm 27.1 says this, says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. If you and I are going to insist on building our lives upon the faulty foundation of our own abilities, then we cannot be surprised when the house we built crumbles to the ground. If we are going to insist on doing it, instead of using God's plan and his foundation, then when our house crumbles, can we be surprised? That's exactly what Abram and Sarai did here. They try and establish God's plan, right? God, we're going to put your plan on top of our own foundation, and that's so backwards. And the question becomes, did they pray about it? Did they see? I, I highly doubt they did. I highly doubt that they sought the Lord about this. I, I think Abram just reacted without really seeking the Lord for his direction. And that's a great question for you and I. As we face different circumstances in life, as we have sometimes uh, perhaps have to be confronted with patience and waiting on God, and now we see something and we want to just reactively go after that thing and maybe take things into our own hands. Have we taken the time to seek him, to pray about it? John 15, 1 through 8, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says these words. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Verse 4, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It is so important, according to Jesus' own words, that we remain in him, right? That we seek him, and that we remember that apart from him, right? When we try and step out of his plan and out of his will to do our own thing, apart from him, we can do nothing. And apart from him, uh, it's like that branch that breaks off and it withers up and it dies. So you've got to remember something. Ezekiel 14, God, God addresses something that really ties in here. Ezekiel writes this, uh, chapter 14, verses uh, 3 through 5. Son of man, though these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces, should I let them inquire of me at all? Therefore, Speak to them and tell them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. When any of the Israelites set up idols in their hearts and put a wicked stumbling block before their faces and then go to a prophet, I, the Lord, will answer them myself in keeping with their great idolatry. I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel who have all deserted me for their idols. Listen, here's how these things tie together. You have one option of, okay, God, I'm going to remain in you. Jesus, I want to remain in you. I want to remain consistent with your word. I want to remain consistent with the vision you placed in my heart. I want to remain consistent in seeking you in prayer. Or you have what Ezekiel says. He says the Israelites, they had adopted these idols in their hearts. What are idols? Idols are anything that we put up on a pedestal before God, right? And so God says, you know what? If they come to me with idols in their hearts, here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to basically answer them through their idols. And so I'm going to give them the answer that they want to hear. Why? Because their hearts are devoted to these other things. Okay, and so we've got to be able, honestly, to take a step back and say, okay, God, is my heart right with you? Are there things, have I already made the decision in my heart to do what I want to do, and now I'm just coming to you, paying you lip service, asking for approval? God says, you know what? You do that with that idol in your heart? I'm going to answer you through that idol. But when you come with a clear heart and say, God, I want to trust in your plan. I want to remain in you. 
I want to I want to trust in your way. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to seek your face. I, I'm going to listen to what you say. And if you tell me no, even though I don't want to hear no, I'm going to accept no. And if you tell me yes, even though I'm scared about yes, I'm going to accept yes, right? And I'm going to learn how to just walk in your plan. God says, you know what? That's building upon the right foundation. That's building a found, on a foundation that's going to, going to last. And now... Those builders in Psalm 127 that were building in vain, now we're not building in vain. Now we're building this thing in a way that's pleasing to God. See, here's the thing. A lot of us can relate to Abram and Sarai. A lot of us can look at, at our life and in, in some way, somewhere along the way, we've received a calling, right? We've been, maybe been called to the mission field. We've been called to the ministry. Maybe it was a, a promise like the one they got. Maybe it was a promise for children. Maybe you feel like God stirred up a dream of, of some kind in your heart for a career or for a, a talent that you have. And yet, five years have passed. Ten years have passed. Fifteen years have passed. The clock, like the clock for Abram and Sarah, is ticking, and you don't feel any closer. And, and, and listen, I can empathize. I've been there. Man, I've been there. I have mopped the floors of a church waiting to be a pastor. I have answered phones as a secretary of a church and said, uh, let me put you through the pastor. And in my heart, I wanted to be the pastor that somebody else was being put through too. Okay, I've been there and it was hard on those days. It was hard on those days. I'm not going to sugarcoat that, but I look back and I realize I wasn't ready yet. I wasn't ready yet in some of those times. I thought I was then. I couldn't see that then. But I realized, looking back, I wasn't ready. God still had a work to do in me before he could fulfill his promise in my life. You know, in closing, as the, as the musicians come, I, I heard a story this week about a woodcarver. This woodcarver was one of these guys who he would... Uh, he would sell his products at like craft sales, flea markets, that kind of thing. And he was very good at what he did. He would, he would carve all kinds of figurines. He had dozens, hundreds of different figurines. He would carve out animals and boats and, uh, you know, hand-carved chess sets. And, I mean, you name it, this guy, he did it all. And so one day, this woodcarver was there at one of the craft sales that he was a vendor at. And, and typically what he would do is he would sit there and he would, as he was having the customers come up, he would sit there and he would whittle his wood. He would be working on the next project, whatever it was. And so he had literally just sat down for a few minutes. He had just gotten a block of wood. He had just gotten his knife. He had only been going a few minutes. And this little guy comes up to his booth and says, uh, hey there, mister. You know, that's my little guy voice. Hey there, mister. I really like all, this is really neat. I really like all this stuff. This is, this is great. You're really good at what you do. And Oh, yeah, they, you know, thank you, thank you. That's, that's really nice. Say, say, say mister, I, I, got, I got a question. What's that one in your hands there going to be? He looked down at the block of the wood, and he says, Oh, this, this you know, I'm, I'm making a lion. Really? It doesn't look much like a lion. It just looks like a block of wood. I, m mister, I, let me ask you, how do you, how do you suppose that block of wood is going to turn into a, one of these detailed nifty night how, how do you do that mister and he says you know it's actually pretty simple I take my knife in one hand I take my block of wood in the other hand and then I just cut off everything that doesn't look like a lion and you know that is exactly what God is doing in our lives is he has your life in his hand and he is whittling whittling away everything that doesn't look like Jesus and he just takes that block of wood. And you know what? If he took it and put it out on display right now, people would look at it and say, what is that thing? Look, it must be a Picasso, <laughs> you know? It's all distorted and disfigured and, and goofy. That, I can't even tell what that is. Why? Because it, was, it would be half finished. But he's working on it. He's working on it. He's, he's trimming away all the things, pruning off all those things in our life that don't resemble Jesus. And one day, He'll be able to put that product out on display and say, look at what I made with your life. And then you'll be ready. But in the meantime, we've got to learn how to be patient. We've got to learn how to wait. And sometimes, like Abram and Sarai, you've got to wait a long time. 
a long time. Do you know that they end up having to wait another 14 years? Another 14 years before God fulfills the promise, and we're going to get to that in weeks to come. Real quick, let me, t- let me tell you one other thing that happens here. Hagar runs out to the desert. The Bible says that it takes an angel to meet her out in the desert to get her turned around. An angel shows up and, she, and he says, Hagar, I want you to go back to Abram. I've seen your, yeah, the Lord has seen your plight. He's seen how you've been mistreated, but don't worry. The boy that's in your womb, you're to name him Ishmael. But then he says something else. He says, this son that, that you're going to give birth to, just so you know, he's going to be a wild man. In fact, literally it says that his hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Do you know that if you, uh, th- that, that if you look into the tradition and the history of this, do you know who Ishmael becomes? The father of the Arabs. The Muslims believe that, the Christians believe that, and the Jewish people all believe that truth, that Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. That very word that was spoken came true, that there has, from that day, been discord between Isaac and and Ishmael, right? There's been violence. Thousands, countless lives have been influenced by that one decision of Abram and Sarai to step out in disobedience out of God's timing. Isn't that interesting? The ramifications, the consequences that the world has known because of the mistake of this man, who, by the way, Abraham, great man of faith. The Bible records him as a great man of faith. This is like his biggest mistake right here his biggest error of judgment right here. And yet, he goes on to be a great man of faith. God is able to redeem it. But I I wonder this morning, what if instead of taking a shortcut, we learn how to be the materials in the hands of our loving Father, that in his timing, in his perfect will, we let him fashion us into what he needs us to be so he can set us out on display and use our life for his glory without anybody looking around this morning, just very quickly, you'd say, you know what, Pastor Ryan? Uh, This this is where I'm at. This is where I'm at. I'm I'm waiting. I'm waiting, 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 waiting. I'm tired of waiting. I've, I've grown so exhausted of waiting. I know God has spoken some things over my life at different times. It feels like we're never making any headway here, and I'm so tempted to just take things into my own hands. I'm tempted to just to just jump the gun and try and get this thing started. Maybe you've even gone down that road a little bit. Maybe you've, you've done just that, taken things in your own hands and it hasn't worked out. And yet you're like, is this ever going to happen? Is this promise that I've been given ever going to happen? This morning, I want to pray for you that believe that God is going to give you some endurance, some endurance to keep persevering, to keep running that race and to keep trusting in him, to remain in him, as John 15 talks about. Would you just slip up your hand if that's you? I want to pray for you right where you're at this morning. Awesome. Okay, awesome. Hands everywhere. Lord Jesus, right now, I pray that you would begin to minister your power. Holy Spirit, minister your power to each one of these lives. God, I pray that you would begin to stir up endurance, 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 to keep trusting you. God, to keep waiting. God, I know for some of these that have hands raised, they've waited five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. There was a promise and they've been hanging on to it. They're holding on to it. It's so good. Lord, if it would just come to pass, it's so good. It's so exciting. And yet they look at their life and much like Sarai, they feel like the clock is ticking and I'm not getting any younger. And yet, Lord, I believe that you do want to bring to, 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 to bring to birth, Lord, to, to birth this thing in their life, whatever it may be. And so, God, I pray, give them endurance. Give them hope. Lord, if they've, if they've made the mistake of trying to take things into their own hands, God, I pray uh, for your mercy and your grace over them, Lord, as they, just, as they just begin to correct that and begin to turn their eyes back upon you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, praise God. I hope you hope you got something out of this morning. I hope you walk away challenged, something to, something to nibble on throughout the course of the week. God is good. He's got an awesome plan for you. Keep, 
keep living strong for him. Love you, church. Don't forget, next Sunday, we'll be on the other end. We hope to see a bunch of you bowling tonight. Otherwise, have a fantastic week.